anyone, do you know about TED? And sometimes you might hear a response that sounds like, TED, who's that? Well, this is the answer I've been dying to give those people. Once upon a time, there lived three siblings. Their names were Ted, Ned, and Winifred. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a poet, I really like rhymes. Ted is that popular kid in high school. He's all about ideas worth spreading. In fact, ideas worth doing. He gives money for wishes, makes dreams come true, even knows how to throw the best party in town. On the other hand, Ned is awkward where Ted is popular. He's shy and uncertain of himself. He's all those ideas inside our head that we don't know the worth of yet, that we may never spread or even say out loud. Ted seems to have everything going for him. His life is built around something hugely important, a virtual chorus, deep sea diving, searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, a pirate-themed tutoring store, or teaching the world the joy of statistics. He has a loss, a journey, and all of them really are the hero's journey, full of vision and struggle and change. Now, when I look in the mirror, as I do quite often, just kidding, not that much of a narcissist, thank God. <laughs> when I look in the mirror, as my sister does quite often, <laughs> I don't see a hero. When I look back at my life, all 15 years of it so far, I don't see a hero's journey. I don't see one big idea. I don't see one defining moment. I don't even see one epic fail. When I look back at my life, instead of seeing a feature film, I see moments, exchanges, images. I see snippets of life. Is this so surprising, though? Ask yourself what you see. Isn't life, for most of us, more a series of snippets? When you wake up in the morning, probably you're like most of us. We don't have these grand epiphanies or great adventures. We have small realizations and little sidetracks. And I would argue that it is in these woven parts of our lives, these singular and often unrelated threads, that we can find life's greatest value. And that's what Winifred is all about. The first snippet of my life that I'd like to share with you comes from the summer of 2012. And I mentioned summer of 2012 because it was the first season that I had days where I would stay up all night simply for conversations. Conversations redolent with carefree idealism, the feeling that we were, each one of us, philosopher kings. My quintessential coming-of-age summer happened um, with a lot of people, but especially those conversations with two friends, Hannah and Riley. And one night, we stayed up until 6 a.m., which is a long time to talk. What I preserved from that night, aside from sleep deprivation, was the essential and unbending value of a good conversation. Some people call it idea sex. I would say that it's not just where beautiful minds meet, but where they're born. People will tell you that an idea is worthless if you don't do something with it, if it doesn't translate to action. Thomas Edison once said, the value of an idea lies in the using of it. So that night in 2012, I learned to disagree. Recently, my mom and I got into a heated argument. You could pass it off as just another teenage girl and her mom events, although instead of cars or boys or anything else, we were arguing about the merits of publishing books. And as she sat glowering at me from across the kitchen table, she said this, where would your writing be if it weren't published? Stuck on your computer? Worthless? I stopped her right there because I completely contested the idea that writing no one sees is worthless, that value comes somehow from the eye of the beholder. I knew from my visceral reaction that I had a problem with more than what my mom was saying. I had a problem with our society's construction of what value is. And we all do it. Do me a favor and visualize value. Visualize it hard. What do you see? For a lot of us, we probably see something tangible, something measurable, money, action. And yet, everything about that summer 
could not be measured. All those conversations, they leave pretty impressions. They stick in our minds and they change our attitudes. And I'm reminded of Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick and what he said in his election campaign in responding to an opponent. You can tell I'm a bit of a political junkie. <laughs> he said this about his opponent. Her dismissive point is that all I have to offer is words, just words. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Just words, just words. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. Just words. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Just words. I have a dream. Just words. Even in this crowd, we get high off of ideas worth spreading from the stage, yet we often overlook the inherent value of an idea worth internalizing that could arise in a conversation from this audience among any one of you. I've been to many, many conferences where what you do seems to matter far more than what you think. And it's dispiriting to meet people for whom your business card probably matters more than your presence. After enough times, it's easy to start internalizing this feeling, I deserve to be ignored. And then, at a conference this year, someone changed that notion for me. Uh, Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm, she now teaches at Berkeley, had a conversation with me over dinner, and I was fangirling the entire time, because political junkie. I was like, holy crap, she's actually talking to me. So I got over that, like, she's an amazing person. But right after that, she uh, had gone back to her seat and then later came over, winking, she dropped a note on my plate. And I picked it up, still only half believing that this was life, opened it up and read, Adora, this is your conscience, go to Berkeley. This is your brain, go to Berkeley. This is your heart, go to Berkeley. Major in political science and set the world on fire. So obviously, I'm this girl who's crazy about politics, receiving this from former governor of Michigan, and what do I do? Run back to my hotel room and Instagram that right away. <laughs> But more than Instagram gold, that note was a lot to me. Um, because whether in the end I choose to go to Berkeley, Stanford, or every single admissions officer on the face of this planet hates me and I get in nowhere and have to take a gap year, does not matter. What mattered was that in this simple conversation that had no measurable value, she gave me something of infinite value. A vision of myself as a catalyst, a girl who could set the world on fire, a Prometheus, if he were a girl. Now, sometimes the best conversations we have may happen on paper. A letter is different from a conversation face-to-face. -face. A conversation is immediately interactive. A letter creates that space of time and space and allows us the chance to be introspective. I started writing letters many years ago, although I wasn't sure why until I started browsing PostSecret. Raise your hand if you've ever been there. PostSecret.com. Okay, it's a blog started by TED speaker Frank Warren, and the concept is simple. Send in postcards with your secrets on them. And one was this. I used to think that I wrote to people so often to make them happy, but now sometimes I wonder if I'm not just creating my own Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb trail of letters so that I don't get lost. My breadcrumb trail of letters came in the form of my first long-lasting correspondence, which was with my great-grandmother Molly. And the stuff of our letters was admittedly not book-worthy. Her illegible script had to be deciphered, especially by my dad. But there were the gems, anecdotes that reflected her irascible nature. Her stories painted a picture of a woman who defied social norms and did what she wanted, for better or worse. Reading her letters, I learned about everything from her divorce at a time many, many decades ago when that was unthinkable, and her struggles with cancer. Great-grandma Molly lived on the East Coast, and I in Washington State, so I only ever met her a couple times in my life. And when she had a serious fall on the ice in wintertime, I hadn't seen her in years. 
As the days passed, her condition worsened, and so, as I always did, I sat down to write her a letter. Like all of our letters, it was comfortingly mundane. I don't remember what I chose to talk about that time, whether it was frozen food or my day's schedule or what classes I was taking. But it was the last letter I sent her, and the only one to which she never replied. When she passed away, I realized that I felt numb more than sad. I didn't cry. I had this growing and selfish realization that her passing meant there would be no more letters to fill up the shoebox in my room, that I had no way to create that breadcrumb trail of letters to keep me from getting lost. Whatever form they take, conversations are the winding, hidden roads that can take you to places where you wouldn't be able to go otherwise, where nothing else can take you. And too often, far too often, these roads are left untraveled. In June, I will walk at my high school graduation, hopefully, and I will see names and I will see faces and hear names that I don't even recognize. Among that large group of unfamiliars, there will be unrealized great conversations. Who knows what I could have talked about with that popular kid or with that cheerleading girl. In March of this past year, University of Pennsylvania senior Ankit Shaw came to a very similar realization about the number of fellow students he simply didn't know. And so he actually did something about it. He created a website called Let's Get Tea, which was very simple. And the description read this. Hi, my name's Anki. Like every other senior at Penn, I have six weeks left. If I haven't met you, I want to. Let's get tea and share stories I won't bite. That last line being the most important. By April 4th, over 160 people had signed up for Let's Get Tea. <laughs> Meeting beautiful minds is an act as random as it is precious, and you never know who you might be missing. Look around you right now. Are those people you could have conversations with over there and over there and sitting right next to you if you guys are strangers up there, all around, outside, walking on the city streets? Think about it. Ankit Shah learned who he was missing through hundreds of conversations that flowed from Harry Potter to solipsism. He soon switched the format so that people could stay beyond their time slots if they wanted to, and all but one person stayed till the very end. Conversations. From arguments with my friends about imperialism and feminist theory and art history and why I still have not started watching Doctor Who, to the sharing of life's everyday moments with my great-grandmother, to meeting the yet unmet individuals who can take me places I might never go without them. Conversations are at once insightful and sobering, abstract and concrete, sympathetic and self-unraveling. And often, if you're online, peppered generously with lol, lol, lol. Everybody wants to have these conversations. University students, silver-haired grandparents on the other side of the country, intelligent, powerful people like an ex-governor, and teenagers in the summertime. When we take the time to listen, to argue, to agree, we are saying we are worth hearing and we have something worth hearing, not something worth selling, not something worth looking at, maybe not even something worth spreading or something worth doing, worth acting upon, but something simply worthy about who we are. So what is the role of action then and how does it fit into this seemingly very subtle picture of the quiet interactions we have with one another? Well, let's go back to the story at the beginning of these three siblings, Ted, Ned. If Ted is about spread and Ned is about what's in your head, told you I like rhymes, then where's the middle ground? Well, Winifred. Winifred doesn't have Ted's hero's journey. She doesn't have Ned's uncertainty and awkwardness. <laughs> She's not the messages we spread to the world or the actions we incite, but the little conversations along the way, the conversations that we barely notice and as they redirect us with unseen changes, the unseen change that happens in the wee hours and during the unmonumental moments that shapes us quietly like water shapes the stones. I find it simultaneously strange and humbling to realize what thin threads we are on the tapestry of history, how shallow our footprints on the sands of time can be. 
I believe surely in leaving those footprints and in the value of action. I mean, one of my favorite quotes is Horace Mann's rousing, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. No pressure. <laughs> But I also believe keenly in the value that ideas have all by themselves. For where will we achieve those victories if not first within our minds? Thank you.